so often the best year to own a stock, you really don't see your gains until the third year. One of the things when you look at the company, you want to say, are the problems internal or the problems external? When people are told, oh, here's the company to invest in, the first question to ask is, well, what do they do? And that's actually not the most important question. The most important question is... Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie. And like I said at the top, I'm here with Eddie Alfenbein. Eddie, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. I have been really looking forward to this conversation because you do something very fascinating. And for those who don't know, you publish something called The Buy List. It's now an ETF, which, which we'll talk about. But also, you only touch this fund once a year. So <laughs> there is so much to uh, discuss around this, but I want to first dive into the performance and then talk about the updates to the fund for 2023, et cetera. So I'm going to go ahead and brag a little bit for you. So the 2022 fund performance came out to a negative 10.42%, but nine, negative 9.28 adjusted for dividends, which is versus the benchmark of the S&P 500 mm -hmm. at negative 18.11%. So an outperformance of nearly 9%. I mean, that's not to be understated in the year we just had. So I wanted to, as you know, 2022 was one of the worst years on record for the stock market. So talk to us about what it was like to live through it, knowing you had to wait till the end of the year to make any changes. It was a difficult year. And sometimes you want to take the hammer and bust the case in and grab it and make changes. But I always feel is sticking with the rules is in the long term, it's better because you don't exactly, you don't panic. It, it Keeping with these strict rules forces you to stick to your game plan and, and stay with the stocks that you like. And it was an interesting year because I believe it was the fourth worst calendar year of the past 80 years. Now, some of that is, is the calendar effect because the peak day was the very first trading day of the year. And then we were tempted with multiple bear market rallies. So a lot of times people just going by their gut instinct, they would have been fooled. They would have thought, okay, this is past this by and we're going to go right back. Nope. Then the bears came right in and pushed us lower. It happened again and again. I think the low didn't happen until uh, the low so far uh, until mid-October. So nearly in the entire year, the bias was always to the downside. It's a really difficult year for a stock market and the bond market as well. There's uh, the 60-40 portfolio, legendary strategy, and that had one of its worst years on record as well. It seems like there were no safe places. Now, your ETF, which is the ticker is CWS, and you launched this in 2016. It's had an amazing run. But it kind of ended up flat for the year, which I have to assume is only a good thing, you know, considering uh, <laughs> the, the market we had. But maybe talk to us about how you saw the ETF performing, you know, versus the fund uh, list on its own. Mm -hmm. We have to be very careful in our language on that and saying that the ETF is based on the buy list. It's not always going to be exactly 100% the same. For example, an ETF just has to hold a small position in cash. So the, it's something like 0.3 or 0.4%. We have to do that where when I do my, my those calculations, that's not figured in at all. Um, it was, it, it's always difficult <laughs> at a year like that. We sucked just, we sucked less than everybody else. And as odd as that sounds, that actually is very important in long-term performance. In many ways, in a strongly bullish year, we're probably not going to be up as much, but the it's not symmetrical. So we'll do much better in difficult years and not as well better in those strong years and string together many years of that. It results in long term outperformance. So it is odd saying, you know, the ETF was flat or, you know, we didn't get those returns. That's actually good news considering the environment. And also when we, uh, at the end of the each year, we rebalance all of the positions. So many aspects were getting good prices once we do that rebalancing. 
A couple of thoughts on that. I mean, what's so fascinating about it being flat is that it's all equities, right? Also, it's not like all this equity. is some sort of ETF that's hedged with a bunch of different asset classes. It's all equities, which I find really interesting. Now, I know your rule of thumb is to, well, I don't know if this is a hard and fast rule, remind me, but I know you swap about five stocks mm -hmm. every year. This year, were you tempted to change more than five? Because <laughs> I know there <laughs> were some dogs in there. Actually, believe it or not, I, I, I was tempted to do less than five. Sometimes it gets harder. And we've always said, uh, you know, five stocks each year. And my, uh, my business partner says, there's no reason you can do four or three. And that's true. But we've never done that. And sometimes I do have difficulty selecting which one I want to get rid of. And you become just naturally, you sort of become attached to them. And you have to fight that urge. You need to be as rational and, and business-like as possible. But for example, one of the stocks, uh, Church and Dwight, I like a lot about it. And there's a lot of things I like about this company. And ultimately, I made the decision to, to drop it uh, this year. They just had a number of issues crop up during the year as far as managing expenses and dealing with the supply problems and, and inflation, I think hurt them more than they realize or I realize. And so I had to let that go. And I said, oh, not Church and Dwight. I like that stock so much. More than once, we've had companies that we've cut and rejoined us. And that even happened this year with a cool company, Middleby, which uh, did very well for us. We didn't have it in 2022. I'm not a good market timer, but boy, we got that right because the stock got flattened last year. And then I looked at the numbers, well, hey, we'll just add it right back. And so, you know, that can happen. A lot of times, maybe that will happen with Church and Dwight down the line. So it's it's always nice. And another one that did very well for us this year was, I uh, now it's called FICO. It used to be called Fair Isaac. I think legally it's Fair Isaac, but I think they're trying to push the FICO. And it even, when it's entered the lexicon, when FICO score, and the American knows what you're talking about. And they uh, they had a great year for us. Had a good, one of our top performers. They even jumped thirty percent in one day, and they were on. And I I got rid of them uh, years ago. I probably shouldn't have done that. I, I have to atone for my sins. <laughs> well, it's funny how you know that human bias is always going to be a part of the equation unless you're a total quant, right? But exactly, you're yeah. mitigating it with these once a year changes, right? I, I imagine that has a huge impact. So a couple of points on what you just said there, the Church and Dwight one. In our last conversation, you, you talked about a little bit, you were explaining it as sort of the uh, you know, baking soda and condoms company. <laughs> where, <laughs> so you never have a, a hesitation buying something like that. Because if you think about it, like, you know, a Buffett style stock where it's boring, or just at least like everyone's going to always meet these mm -hmm. products. Um, I found that to be surprising that it, it went away. So is the sentiment on that more around management as far as like what you were saying there? Is it not, not so much the, the conglomerate itself uh, as far as the products go, but more about how they're managing the company itself? I mean, it, it's both. I would say that you know, in the sense that it was management uh, was blindsided by the macro environment, particularly sale, you know, the, the cost passing on the cost of goods in a, in a uh, sector that's very competitive as far uh, as costs. And they had a difficulty do, dealing that. I'm trying to look through, they they said their, sa their organic sales would be negative. Um, I'm trying to recall what their, um, they had, they said earnings growth would be something like four to eight percent. That got cut. And then they said basically it would be flat. That happened all throughout the year. And so that sort of led me to, instinctively i tend to like it if it if it gets into a little trouble but ultimately i thought and, and also i wasn't really wild about the recent growth numbers a very a similar story with reynolds consumer products uh much f facing many of the same issues and got rid of it for many of the same reasons so you mentioned middleby as well you brought it back, as you mentioned. You, you let go of it in 2020, I believe. Talk to us about why or what it's done to win you back. Well, I, I mean, I have to talk about this was one of the most incredible roller coaster rides we had because though they make sort of industrial kitchen supplies, big ovens and you know, conveyor belt of things. And 
when the lockdowns came in, in March of 2020, the stock got absolutely clobbered. You see, you know, hotels, businesses, this is what is going to impact them. The stock fell, I'm trying to think it was a, around 120 and it fell to 40 within days. I mean, it was so fast and so hard. And then the company put on one of the most spectacular rallies and it got to 200 by uh, the end of the year, R- right around there. I, I, I may be off some, but it, it vaulted from its uh, March low. And that's when I said, okay, this is too much. Let's take some profits uh, off the table on this. So this year it fell again. It fell back to about from 200 to about 120. And I was looking at the earnings reports and the last one, the, the bottom line missed, but the numbers were quite good. I think the EBITDA growth was around, was 23.5. Uh, it's odd what numbers you can remember. I think that's what they did. So they were still showing impressive numbers. And I, I'm trying to think it was around $10 per share is what we're looking for earnings, give or take. And it's around 140. That's not bad for this environment. And also, I just like the, the long-term growth of their operating income. It's a nice grower. It's a good business to be in. So I saw that the numbers continued to look good this year and the price went down. And so I figured, hey, this is a good time to get back in. Maybe we'll, we could have the same magic with it. But I, I really like this company. Now, I think I do know the answer to this, but I wanted to make sure. Do Did any of the macro themes leading into 2022 help inform the list at all? You know, knowing interest rates were likely going up and you were seeing inflation, et cetera. Were you looking to build more of a defensive portfolio going into the year? Uh, yeah, the, the short answer is no. But the longer answer is that even by not doing that, it helped us very much. And I think that was the key driver to our outperformance that last year. And I can't take any credit for that w- whatsoever. But the, this is how I would describe it. And uh, it's probably filler for a, a lot of listeners. But when COVID came, the market got very scared. And the government, particularly the federal government and the Federal Reserve, responded massively. In many ways, I think they were trying to not do what had happened during the financial crisis, where the response was somewhat slow, only as they saw more and more evidence did did the response get more dramatic. This time, they responded dramatically and very early. So you have to understand that the stock market is a delicate balance between return and risk. And what the Federal Reserve did was it said, we're going to take risk off the table. Risk it. We're going to basically, if you prefer, we're going to nationalize risk. That completely warped the market. It's like putting a magnet near a compass because all of these areas that are much riskier, they had a free ride. They had a backstop. So all of these uh, sectors, you know, Places like you know Peloton and Zoom, and they just took off to the moon. We saw these enormous uh, rallies in this, and also in the crypto world, also in the NFT world, just all those high risk areas. Meanwhile, the boring areas, the value areas, the low volatility areas were really left behind. So the story of 2022 was we completely unspooled that. And all the high risk areas, I saw uh, Facebook, Meta platforms, it fell by what, 60, 70%. Tesla was down. All of, I mean, the, the stars of the lockdowns really, they, they fell significantly. And then a lot of the value, I wouldn't call uh, the ETF a value one, but it, it was value, high quality, and those did well. Uh, so it was the resurgence. And that was look, when when interest rates are at zero, who cares about a P.E. ratio? I mean, it, it doesn't matter. But suddenly when rates are at uh, up or three or four percent, then suddenly people worry about things like valuation. So in many ways, 2022 was the waking up to that, that the valuations came back 
and some sanity was restored to the market. I didn't predict any of that, but uh, I certainly rode its events all throughout last year. That's that sort of rotation, right? Uh, you, you hear about every so now and then from you know, momentum into value, into growth, et cetera. In our last discussion, you said that every year, the biggest winner is always one that surprises you. So I'd like to go over the top five winners and highlight perhaps some ideas as to why they they did so well. But before doing so, I'm curious to know which stock surprised you the most. Mm, oh boy, uh, maybe Aflac. It just you know it's such a steady, uh, st- steady business. They do what they do so well. And uh, it had. Uh, do you have the numbers in front of you? I don't know. I do. Yeah, twenty three point two one percent. Wow. And so, and but it was uh, 40 points better than the S&P 500. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, supplemental insurance. It's nothing, nothing really. But also, I think that going back to the previous point, it shows you the effect of, you know, it, it did a, a lot better. It had a better year than Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And to be quite honest, that one in particular uh, is still looking undervalued uh, to me, which I'm going to, I'm going to cover yeah. a few of my my three that uh, I see in the new list that I'm still very optimistic about, but I'll just spoil it. That one, uh, even though it went up 20, 20 odd percent in 22, still seems very undervalued. And last time we, we did touch on this one in the last episode a year ago, and you mentioned that 70% of the revenue comes from Japan, yeah. which I still find to be kind of a fascinating fact. Do you see that shifting? Are they going more global? Is there growth coming from elsewhere now, or is it all kind of so a lot of it coming from that part of the world. Well, they have, have close to a monopoly in, in Japan. So that's always going to be a large part of their business. But they do a significant business and a growing business in the United States. I don't know how, how well that's going to be balanced in the long term. But you know, when you look at the business and they're you know, known for the famous ads with the Aflac duck, America is pretty small <laughs> in, in their universe. I think Japan will continue to be a, uh, a, a major source and the dominant source of their business. So some of the other big winners, you mentioned FICO. That was up a little over 38%, which is incredible. HSY, which is Hershey, 19.69%. And then we had Scientific American, which or Scientific Application. I see, yeah. Yeah, SAIC, 32.71%. We discussed this last time. So if you want to go back to our last episode, we kind of touched on this one in depth. Your shorthand for it was that it's a, think about it like the Pentagon's IT help desk, which I've always liked. Um, You have this uh, gift for coming up with these really sticky branding uh, ideas uh, for these stocks, which I love. Can I say something something about Hershey? And this is a fact, and this is a, a good lesson for investors, people listening out there, is that so often the best year to own a stock, you really don't see your gains until the third year. And with Hershey, it was really our fourth year. So we had had it on the buy list for three years and it had done well, nothing great. But then it outperforms by what, 50% this year. It really turned into a rock star this year and it's on, on the buy list for the fifth year. So that is, you know, people want to see immediate gains. When you do a lot of focused stock picking, it takes a while before you really see that huge payoff. And, you know, a lot of times they say the best stock to own is one you already know. Another thing with Hershey is that the company said, this was not hidden anywhere. The company said, we are having productivity problems. We cannot keep up with demand. And there are multiple articles about this. It's sort of like they were advertising. Anyone who just bothered to pay attention would see that the company was doing very well and their problem that they were dealing with was managing growth. And they have since increased capacity to keep up with business. It's so odd that this is a name everybody knows. You know, as I said, there's no city in America called, you know, low fat Pennsylvania, but there is for for Hershey for chocolate, there absolutely is. They were basically telling us right to our faces. It was a, a bargain hidden in plain sight. So I do, I just wanted to add that bit about Hershey. I'm glad you did. I mean I, I did I touched on it with David Gardner recently, uh the Motley Fool, because uh 
I was I was challenging him on on non sort of tech oriented stocks, uh, for lack of a better way to say it. And I mentioned that it had reached its 52 week high. And that was fairly fairly recently, you know, in a year where the S&P 500 did what it did. I mean, the markets just in general did what they did to hit your 52 week high in a year like that's pretty remarkable. Well, I, I like their business model. They make chocolate and then they sell it for more than they make it. And then they repeat that. <laughs> and there's nothing high tech about it whatsoever, but it's a very profitable business. Now, another big winner was Silgan, if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah. Um, Silgan Holdings, which was up 21.01%. And again, this is one we highlighted uh, at our last discussion because it was standing out to me as another one that seemed pretty undervalued. This one, uh, just to recap, is sort of the metal containers stock mm -hmm. as well. You mentioned it's very boring. It's very underlooked or overlooked. And uh, and maybe just talk about maybe the, the validation you saw with that stock going into the year. This, I have to say, is one of my favorite stocks, and I have a soft spot uh, for it. And it, it's a very boring company, but I think of it this way. Whatever their market cap is, I don't know, five billion or so. If someone said, here's a check for $4 billion and recreate, go off and do what Silgan does, I don't think you'd be able to do it. You need a lot more money to be able to do this. They have um, production facilities all over the place, so it's very, very close by to whatever you want to do. It's not just metal. They do all sorts of containers. No matter any business needs a container, needs something to ship it in. Um, and they're the kind of company that if you're going to be in business that involves containers, it's hard to avoid Silgan. I mean, if you wanted to, if you said purposely, we're going to avo avoid them, that would be very evident in your business decisions. Uh, they're just a, a part of the industry that you need to deal with. They service their sector and they do a really good job of what they do. So it's a cool little company. Now, I'm jumping to an assumption here, but given all the supply chain issues we had, and it seemed metal containers were part of the equation, just being really high in demand and very low in supply. Did we see a big price increase happen for, for Silicon? Did they, were they able to capitalize on that? What, do you think that was part of the market performance? Maybe talk a little bit about you know, the revenue growth or something that yeah. was driving here. Uh, yeah, I, I think it was a good example of uh, revenue growth does not always equal volume growth. So I think they, they did a good job of, of balancing the higher prices and getting to their customers as well. So that was a, uh, a key issue last year for them. And I, w I was impressed by the way uh, the, the, the company performed. All right, well, let's talk about some of the uh, bigger losers here. I'm just gonna go over a couple of them. <laughs> you mentioned Reynolds, but that one, although it was facing headwinds, like you said, it wasn't down that big. It was only down negative 4.52%, but you still mixed it for 2023, whereas Trex, ticker T-R-E-X, was down negative 68%, but has stayed in the mix for 2023. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious to know more about what drove these decisions. You know, it's obviously not <laughs> all performance related. Right. Sure. So one of the things when you look at the company, you want to say, are the problems mm -hmm. internal or the problems external? If the problems are external, like a good example is Aflac. They always have to deal with the yen dollar exchange rate. But the thing about that factor is it comes and goes. So if it works against you one quarter, it may work against you in the future. But if there's a problem with the business, something endemic to them, that's a much bigger issue. So with uh, Trex, so they make the fake wooden decks. They were blindsided by the housing industry or, or knocked uh, down due to the weakness in the housing sector. It's not really due to their failings as a business. Once the housing sector revives and gets better, I would have every reason to believe that Trex will get better. There's nothing implicit within the business that is a, is a problem for Trex. So that's, that's the key. And um, whereas uh, what we were talking about was Reynolds, yeah. uh, the ones uh, that I thought there was you know, greater problems in the uh, 
performance of in the uh, execution of their business that had me more concerned. So going into 2022, Reynolds, uh, you were looking at it, I believe we talked about it a little bit last time as a, a turnaround opportunity. Their free cash flow had recently taken this huge dive and it, it dropped off the list in 23. But I, I'm just kind of curious, was that not the case, just not seeing the turnaround opportunity or it just didn't prove out in the time frame you were looking and, for? Yeah, I, I would say so. I'm trying to remember the numbers. I think they they said that EPS for this year would be a buck fifty six to a buck seventy, something around that, and then that was lowered once, and then it was lowered again to around a dollar thirty per share. So, we'll, you know, the Q four numbers will be out later this month or maybe in early February. So, it was that continue not one but two downgrades that really had me concerned about what was going on, and I I didn't feel that it was turning around the way my thesis was. And that's really a key to s selling a stock when it's no longer the company that your original thesis was. And I had to come to the realization that my reasons for buying the stock were not panning out, even though the loss wasn't that bad. Let's dig in a little bit more on the 2023 buy list. So you newly added Polaris and there's a, uh, a repeat company there, Step In. And both of their free cash flows seem to have fallen off a cliff fairly recently as well. You know, Stepin, I believe, was uh, 805 million in 2020 to negative 39 million in the trailing 12 months. I do want to check that up. I'm, I might be confusing that. But I, I, the number for 2020 was very high. And, and in fact, I, I believe it had really been creeping up in the late teens. So the 2020 number was significantly uh, high get compared to the, all their previous trends. And you're right, it completely tanked in 2021. And I believe a decent rebound uh, last year as well. Now, also, if you if you look at the operating income, the adjusted operating income, that's pretty stable. And it has been, and I think will continue to be. So it's sort of d d just want to add those other variables to what I look at. The thing about Polaris is, by conventional metrics, it's a cheap stock, and there's a strong cyclical factor to the industry. I mean, snowmobiles and playthings, and obviously that's going to go better when the economy, you know, people are going to cut back on those. So it's a good example of a consumer cyclical stock. And that can be difficult to look at under conventional metrics. And so you always want to adjust for where you are in the economic cycle. So that's just for people doing securities analysis, that can be very tricky because you can get false negatives by just following regular PE or, or EBITDA or, or enterprise value or something like that. So I always want to take a more expansive view on that. Polaris. I'm probably not getting it at the best time, considering the fragility of the economy. But given its price, given its historic operating income, I think there's a very good chance in three years that could turn into a decent winner. So, you know, it's, it's similar to Hershey. So in a way, are you viewing these two stocks as maybe in a similar framework that Reynolds was, where you're looking at them as these turnaround opportunities, or are they simply just economic cycles that you're waiting to pan out? I would say with Polaris is a turnaround element. With uh, with Step In, Matt, just a, that I see it as a continue. I mean, it has 55 years consecutive of increasing earnings. It's also it's, it's a small company. I mean, maybe two and a half billion. In market, a lot of people don't even know about this company. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderfully uh, run company, and that I see as more as the of the long term grower. And uh, even though, yeah, had a difficult year, but I'm I'm optimistic for it. So Miller uh, ticker M I, ah. sorry M L R, had a pretty tough year. Uh, it was down over twenty percent, but you held on to it. And last time. We spoke. You mentioned you do have this uh, soft yeah. spot for this stock. <laughs> so, how has that conviction held up through 2022's performance? Well, let me say is that if you have a well diversified portfolio, 
it's always a good idea to have one off-road stock, one that's kind of different from everybody else, and that's Miller. Uh, Miller is by far the smallest company. So step in is maybe two and a half billion. That's our second smallest. Miller is probably 320 million. I mean, it's it's one eighth the size of our 29th largest company. That's how small it is. And then you compare it to uh, like Thermo Fisher or Danaher, a company like that. You know, it's a, it's a tiny, tiny drop. It's a cool company and I really like it. And th- my thesis is a longer term turnaround. So they make towing and recovery equipment. No analysts file it, no Wall Street. And I mean, there are people who file it, but no major of uh, the w- Wall Street firms. So when you say, what are earnings expectations? We just don't know. What happened with Miller is that the business was very much hurt by the lockdown and the period following the lockdowns. But if you look at the 2019 numbers, I think that earnings were 343 per share. Recently, really a a few weeks ago, the stock was going for $21 per share. So the PE ratio of a couple of years off is what, six times earnings, seven times earnings, but it's just getting up to the full potential of where it had been. The revenue has already got there. The last earnings report was quite good. I think revenue was up maybe 25%. And net income was up 35%. So they're recovering very, very strongly. So I still see it in play. My thesis is that it's a company that was wrecked and is doing well. And a lot of people just don't see it yet. I wouldn't be surprised if Miller is our top performer for this year. But getting back to your larger point, and that is a good example of a 20% loser last year, not bothered at all by it. In fact, it's probably maybe in the last two or three months, it's up 30 odd percent. It's actually been moving up steadily. But as long as I see that, that continuous increase, I'm trying to think this year, so we'll get the Q4 report. They'll do earnings sales of around 900 million. In 2019, their earnings before interest, before taxes, was about 50 million. And so now the market cap is about 320 million. It just seems such like an obvious hold this and wait for the market to come to its senses. I think it's a really neat company. Yeah, this one was interesting to me because this would be sort of on the higher end of what you would call a, a micro cap stock. And I know that you're sector agnostic. Uh, I was kind of curious, though, it raises the question around size agnostic, right? You're not, it kind of jumps all over from mid caps, large caps, and now micro caps. And I'm curious if that's intentional or if, and my second question is just how do the things, how do these micro caps appear on your radar? Because you're go fishing <laughs> a little bit uh, deeper for those. Well, as, as I said, you know, it, it's always cool to, you, to get something that nobody else knows about, to get that. that uh, so I'll get an unusual stock that if I think, uh, especially I like companies that nobody else follows. And that's a great way to find values. I saw that uh, Morningstar, which by the way, just had our, uh, we just got our fifth star for Morningstar. Uh, they call us, thank you. They, they call us mid-cap growth. And I remember when I first met, Really? If we are, it, it means nothing to me. It's just the, the 25 stocks, they put it in their computer and they said, this is mid cap growth. But in no way, I don't, I don't, that, that, that doesn't mean anything to me. But uh, I like to get a couple, uh, like I said, off road companies. I don't know if I'd call Miller small cap or micro cap, but something that nobody knows about. I'm, I think you always want to, uh, you know, it's a simple game. You turn over rocks and look for uh, uh, diamonds and whoever turns over the most rocks wins the game. And that's really what it's about. So I'm willing to look in an unusual, uh, non-traditional place if I think there's a um, a good bargain to be had. Not only that, but I'll write it with a 20% loss in one year. <laughs> it's, it's pretty remarkable. Now, there are a couple other... Uh stocks in the new list that to me are really standing out when I'm using our TIP finance tool, I'm coming up with 
double digit forecasted yields. And we already talked about Affleck, even though it was up in the mid twenties in the last year, I'm still seeing it as a, a very undervalued. Um, so science applications, we already talked about as well, SAIC. So they were up 35% in 2022, still looks undervalued to me. And then there's Selenese, ticker CE. This one really jumped out to me. And uh, not only is it a new addition, but I, our investing tool shows that Buffett and Tom Gaynor both hold small positions in the stock. So I always perk up when I see those names <laughs> attached to something. And it's already up big just in the first 10 days of this year. So give us a high level overview of what Selenese does. They make uh, acetic acid. And that is something that has uh, a huge number of applications within industry. It goes from paint to adhesives. It's a hugely important part of the chemical industry. And they have a 25% market share. It's very, very, not, I wouldn't say dominant, but very strong position within the market. They also make up uh, many, many other chemicals as well. Now, this has been an important year for them. Let me back up and talk about DuPont, which is a company that has struggled over the last few years, and this has been in the news. Over the last five years, I think DuPont is, that the market is up roughly 50%, DuPont is down 50%. So they are trying to change their direction. So they sold one of their major units, and Selene said, yeah, we're interested, and they did a massive deal for the DuPont unit, and it cost $11 billion. So if you see on the balance sheet right now, you see a huge cash position, I think, of $9.5 billion. And this is a not just a, an acquisition, but they're merging with a company uh, a, about their same size. So it's a huge, huge deal that they're doing. And the stock did not do well at all last year. And I think some of that was a reaction. As I look at the numbers, I think it's a good deal. But uh, oh, let's see, Warren Buffett is sitting on a big loss right now in Selenies. But I like it. And I think this deal can be a game changer. It, again, it will. T I think they said it's going to be accretive to earning something like $4 per share this year. So it, it, it just... Uh, the deal closed in November. They announced it in February, just closed it in November. It's a interesting company, and I think this deal will make them even stronger. This one falls right into my wheelhouse as well because, uh, you know, acetic acid, something interesting about the company is that while it does do industrial chemicals, as you kind of mentioned, it's also acetic acid is vinegar, right? So uh, by definition, so it's it goes into food and beverage products. Acetic acid is naturally produced in kombucha, which I know a lot about, you know, so um, so it's it's interesting that it's falling into the consumer product side as well as the industrial market. So it's hitting lots of different industries, um, which I find fascinating as well. All right. So shifting gears a little bit here, um, I'd like to talk about your newsletter because there's some upcoming news we want to definitely get into a little bit here. But first and foremost, I'd like to raise more awareness on this newsletter, talk a little bit more about how you started it. And, and I'm kind of curious just personally or selfishly is if this is what you use to keep your hands busy during the year. <laughs> the newsletter is through Substack. I started writing the newsletter back in 2010 and it's basically the same thing. I, I would send it out. Uh, so th there, there are uh, two newsletters I do. There's a free one that goes out every Tuesday and then there's the premium paid one that goes out late Thursday night. I date it for Friday. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll have special newsletters if something important has happened that I want to talk about. The uh, The Tuesday le letter is more of a general discussion about the markets and the economy, where the premium version talks more about exactly how we should go about uh, investing and what areas look good right now. And I sort of break down the companies and what I like and what I dislike about each company. Let me just say through Substack, uh, it's $200 a year or $20 a month if you want to uh, try that out. So please feel free uh, to check it out. But I've been doing newsletters for a while. Uh, actually, I had I started my first newsletter in, the, uh, in 1997. Uh, I was even uh, featured in the Washington Post a few times. And then after that, I went to work for a newsletter company 
for a number of years. And uh, then I backed out on my own. And so I started the uh, original version of this newsletter in October of 2010. So I've been doing it for a while and I enjoy it. It's a lot of fun and it keeps me busy. In your most recent newsletter, you wrote, quote, in, in Q4, Wall Street analysts slashed their 2023 earnings forecast by 4.4%. That's the largest cut since 2014. Wall Street doesn't buy any of this over 5% talk from the Fed. The futures market currently expects the Fed to hike by 0.25%, 25 basis points in February and another 25 basis points in March. That would bring the target range to 4.75 to 5%. Okay, so the December CPI report comes out tomorrow. So I'm going to ask kind of a fair question, but I always love getting uh, people's real-time predictions on things like this. Where I think the market is expecting it to come in the mid sixes, right? That mm-hmm. seems to be yeah. the consensus. Six, six five. Yep. Yeah. Where do you think it'll come out? Do you agree with that? And if so, what do you think the market reaction will look like? It will be six point five one seven four six two. Now, I, I I don't know, but but as I said, the the more important is that that trend. So it's been going. It was the peak was seven point one. And this, we're talking about the year-over-year rate has declined for the last five months in a row, and I think it's very likely that will be number six. We'll we'll uh, learn tomorrow. I'm not worried about the specific numbers, but it's the trend that inflation appears to be receding. I'm not saying it's fully receded or we're in the safe zone yet, but the trend is going in the right direction. Part of that is due to. Uh, some problems with the economy, most particularly in the housing sector. This is due to the Federal Reserve's higher interest rates. So the context of the bit that you read before was a number of Fed officials coming out with strong rhetoric, tough talk that they're going to keep rates high, they're not worried about the after effects of it, and they're going to fight inflation until inflation is defeated. It's very easy for them to speak that way, to issue tough talk, but to follow through on that is is much more difficult. If the economy continues to weaken through this year, which I think is very likely, I think the Federal Reserve will hold off on its interest rate increases. And in fact, the futures market thinks that the Fed will be cutting interest rates before the end of this year. In fact, interest rates will probably be at the same place they are right now, one year from now. There'll be you know, some minor increases and then some minor decreases. But the Fed, uh, particularly Mr. Bostic, was very, very forthright on his comments earlier uh, this week. I just don't see it happening. And we see it's not just me, but it's in the futures market. It's in those analysts that you just quoted. The Fed is here and the market is here. And whenever that happens, the market or reality has a good track record of prevailing. You also wrote the unemployment rate fell to 3.5%. This was the sixth time the unemployment rate got to 3.5% since 1969. The only months that were lower came during the wars in Korea and Vietnam. In other words, this was the lowest peacetime unemployment rate in 75 years. And I know by peacetime, you just mean there's not a draft you know, going on right. in the US, right? But do you think unemployment is the linchpin here as far as what we'll need to break in order for the Fed to pivot, to actually pivot, right? It's be, meaning decrease rates, or do you see any other risks? And if so, how much do you think unemployment will have to tick up? Oh boy, that is a really good question. I just don't know exactly. I would probably think you know around 5% or so. To see that real, there is the uh, SOM rule uh, for the economist, uh, which is seeing, uh, I think, interest rates go up by half a percent from their low or an average of the low. Uh, so that would bring us up to about, you know, 4% or so. I think that's very possible. Now, the issue that could put a hamper into that is this disjointed nature of the economy where we're seeing housing hit hard, but other areas of the economy are doing just well. In fact, there was just an article 
uh, and the New York Times talking about how this recession may fall harshly or unevenly on white collar workers compared to blue collar workers. I don't know if that will be true. So that could impact how the Fed responds. It's is it the broadness, but my fear is that unemployment and the housing sector or stand right between the Federal Reserve and its goals for inflation. So they are sort of the collateral damage, but we almost always know that's going to happen. My fear is that unemployment rate will rise this year and almost will have to rise this year. So another interesting point from your last newsletter was that you highlighted American Waterworks, it's ticker AWK, And you gave it a very favorable review. It's actually, the stock has been up almost 30% since mid-October of 2022. So it's been on this tear over the last few months. I'm kind of curious why it wasn't included on the 20th. Yeah, I said such nice things about it. And I did my, my, um, so in the uh, Tuesday newsletter, I like to highlight stocks and and I want to draw lessons from that. And this is a an interesting company because it's completely boring. It's a water utility company. And nobody had any hopes for this stock whatsoever. It was spun off by a European subsidiary uh, in 2008. And when they were going to do the IPO, there was no interest in it. They talked about, would it be $25, $26 per share? No, no, but it, it finally went off at 2150. This was in 2008. And the conglomerate got rid of it because they thought it was a no growth area and it was an anchor to them. Nobody on Wall Street was interested in them. And it has been a fantastic success story. It's over, uh, I'm thinking $160, I think is where they are now. So up nearly eightfold. It's been a huge winner. As you said, it's been up handsomely since October. So boring stocks can be great investments. And companies that nobody had any interest in, once they're cut loose from the mothership, they're free to do what they want. In many ways, they are much better at managing themselves. So the point I wanted to make to investors is that there's always a place where you could find good stocks. And the thing is, when people are told, oh, here's the company to invest in, the first question I ask is, well, what do they do? And that's actually not the most important question. The most important question is, how well do they do whatever it is they do? And I almost feel so many uh, novice investors, they want to know, oh, it's, it's, uh, it's involved in artificial intelligence, or it's involved in uh, something with DNA technology or cybersecurity or blockchain. They want to get into the concepts. That's not so important. The company can be as dull as dirt, uh, and American Waterworks certainly is, and it's been a huge, huge winner over the last 14 years. And in fact, to your point, it's pretty pricey now. I think it's 34 times uh, trailing earnings or, or maybe forward earnings as well. Also, that, that the earnings line uh, or the operating earnings is nice and smooth. I really like to see that. And as an investment analyst, it really helps out seeing nice with the complete opposite would be selling these where it's all over the map. But uh, it, it's a cool company, just too expensive right now. I probably should have said that in the newsletter. But yeah, one to keep an eye on. If it does like Middleby, and tanks, I'll certainly consider it. Yeah, I also wanted to highlight that the free cash flow has gone negative over the last few years as well. So it's one of those that's kind of, you know, hard to know when that's going to swing back and, and how to exactly evaluate that kind of thing. But I want to talk a little bit about the buy list as a whole. So you started this in 2006 and its historical performance over its 17 year existence is 435.73%, and that's versus the S&P 500 of 333.17%. So we're talking about an outperformance of over 100%. And you know, I believe that's an outperformance of roughly six or so percent per year, right? So that's, that's, that's pretty remarkable, right? So um, I, I'd love to talk a little bit about how this whole thesis has been playing out for you over this period of time. Obviously, I imagine you're more bullish than ever on it, but are there any 
any other insights or lessons you've learned over the last 17% that you feel like have led to this outperformance other than, you know, simply rebalancing once a year? You know, people ask, they treat the rules of the buy list as if it's a hindrance. And in many ways, I see it as a benefit because so 25 stocks, we turn over five each year. So that means it's an average holding period of five years. So when you add a Selenies or a Middleby, you think, okay, if the stock market were to shut down for the next five years on average, will I be comfortable owning Middleby five years from now? Yes, I would. It forces you to think that way because you know you are going to be married to this stock for quite some time. Aflac, it's on for its 18th year. Pfizer, that's also on for its 18th year. So it, Having these artificial rules, I think in many ways helps me because it forces you to think about these stocks as businesses. What truly makes them valuable? Will they continue to be around in five years or 10 years? So that's, I I think it's a benefit of having this system. Also, I don't panic. What would have happened in March, 2020? What would have happened in late 2008? I, I, how would I have behaved? I don't know, but I know at this point I can say I just I buy it held and I held right on through uh, through earnings. So, it, it, you know, stock selection is the best when it's most business like, and these rules force me to approach it as a business and make business like decisions. So I'd like to learn a little bit, as much as you're willing to share, about Eddie Alfenbein's system for finding these stocks because you know and I'm, I'm more curious actually if it's changed over 17 years right and and my my main question is around what resources you look to or rely on the most whether it's a thought leader in the space or it's the new york Times, you know whatever it might be if it's a sell side buy side what resources do you look to to kind of investigate where you might find undervalued picks um, I would say, you know, mostly what I do is I, I like to look at the annual reports, the, uh, the, the 10 Qs, the 10 Ks, look at what they're, what they're doing on um, and look at their competitors. Uh, whenever I talk with officers of a company, I always like to ask, uh, what do they think of their competitors? That's always an interesting, uh, uh line of inquiry. And I, uh, I, I, uh, will, you know, talk to management talk to the people in investor relations, see what the company is doing. I also pay a lot of attention to the stability of the business. I pay a lot of attention to their market position, how strong, you know, for example, SAIC, you know, if you're in the Pentagon, you're going to have to deal with them at some point because they're just so important to what the mission is of the Pentagon. Uh, it's companies like that that you want to find that, you know, it will be very difficult to replace them. I, I think I talked about how, how would you re- replace Silgan uh, tomorrow? It would be very, very difficult. I like to look for companies with management I trust. So I like to hear uh, co- companies do not have to give earnings forecasts. There's nothing in the rules that say they have to do that. But I like companies that do, and I like companies that you know that these earnings forecasts are reasonably accurate. I don't need them to be right. I just need them to understand the problems. I like to hear companies talk about the problems that they're having. Also, if you just reiterate earnings, that's often dismissed. But I think that's a a good news saying, companies saying things are going to plan. Uh, as planned this year, and they still are uh, going planned. So I never overlook a, a reiteration of earnings. Uh, I want to just have a great deal of trust in the management. You, you can never be 100% perfect, but of the a- Amos family that runs Aflac, these are people I really have a high degree of faith in. I remember when the terrible earthquake happened in Japan, and Dan Amos, the CEO, said, you know, so we got this. This is what we, pl- uh, on Monday morning, when we go to work, we plan for exactly what is happening now. So we have this covered. And ha- having that is such an enormous benefit when you go about investing the, the level of trust that you can place in management like that. I think that's great. Um, 
So for those who want to follow along with this strategy, obviously there's the ETF, the ticker is CWS, which is crossing Wall Street. It's also you know, the blog and, and website that this is all based on. So I really want to give you the opportunity to hand off to the audience more about where they can find more on crossing Wall Street, the ETF, the newsletters, all of those things. Sure. I'll, I'll give, I promise I won't give you the hard sell on, on the ETF, but the ticker symbol is CWS. And I started this with my business partner. I never thought, how do you just start an ETF? But we did, and we were able to get, and I think I looked at the latest numbers and I think but every year, hundreds of ETFs close up shop. We're in our seventh year. I looked at the numbers earlier today. I think we're going to close at an all time high for uh, uh, AUM assets under management. So we are growing and thriving. We beat the market. We just got our fifth star from Morningstar. We were also the first ETF in the history of the world to have a fulcrum fee. So the fee, if we don't beat the market, then the fees go down. If we do beat the market, then I get a little bonus. The fees go up. So it all depends. I, basically, if we do well, I do well. If we don't do well, I don't do well. So my interests are aligned with yours. We are this tiny fund and we were the first ones. Then there are open-ended funds, but we were the first ETF to do that. I never chose a ticker symbol before, so that was something I had a unique ex experience. So CWS was open, so we jumped on that. It's traded on the New York. It's called the New York Arca. So those of you may remember, that was the Archipelago, which was bought by the NYSE, which is owned by ICE, which is another buy list stock. If you were to buy one share of each of the 25 stocks on the buy list, that would run about $4,500. But you can get the whole thing in one package. I think it's right now about $47, $48 per share. We started at 25 back in September of 2016. And so we're just, you know, growing, thriving, getting more converts out there. So it's been a great learning experience. Now we can also have, I'm on Twitter at Eddie Elfenbein, at Eddie Elfenbein. And then at Substack, it's cws.substack.com where I have my newsletters, the free newsletter. If you just want to try that out, that comes out every Tuesday. And then if you want to join us for the premium letter, that's $20 a month or $200 for a whole year. And that comes out. I did it for Friday morning. And I've been doing that for a couple of years now and I really enjoy it. So, And you are one of my favorite follows on Twitter. So I highly recommend people do follow. Your humor is always like a refreshing uh, a part of my feed. So Eddie, I just love everything you're doing here. I think it's incredible. I'm so honored you came back on the show a year later. I hope we can make it a, an annual tradition at this point. Maybe we can keep following up and going over because I, I love this strategy and I think it's so fascinating. So thanks again. And I hope uh, I'll see you in 2024. This was fun. So thanks for having me. So the market's basically frozen. You know, the last time that happened was 2008, 2009. What you're going to see is people that are having financial trouble, one, aren't going to be able to buy homes, but if they get in real trouble, they're not going to be able to pay their rent. So it's a scary situation, I think, for all asset classes. You know, it was leverage upon leverage that really brought the house down.